So good afternoon. Um, it's 12 and I'd like to just go ahead and get started. Um, so I want to first welcome everyone for joining us um, for this Arts and Resilience series. Um, I want to give a few housekeeping type of announcements first before I get the chance to introduce our speaker. Um, first off, thanks to UT Wellness for helping to sponsor this event. Um, we were offered uh, this to the first 25 uh, participants with a UT email address who registered. So um, if you are one of those 25 people, you will be getting it in inner office email, or if you're a student, it'll be in your mailbox. Um, also for students, if you are taking or attending for credit, um, you should have received an invite to the Canvas page for this series. Um, if you haven't, feel free to email me. Um, we also have our next speaker um, scheduled in November, so more information will come um, as that approaches. So without further ado, can everyone hear me okay? I just want to make sure. Um, I think so. Okay, good. Um, I'd like to go ahead and introduce uh, Laura Spector. Um, I'm a huge fan of hers, so I feel like I shouldn't be biased, but in this case, I think it's okay. Um, she has a really impressive background, so I'm only going to hit the highlights. Um, we have a link to her um, uh, artist webpage off of our McGovern Center website. So um, she has studied fine art at the Flemish uh, Classical Atelier in Bruges, but also at the Virginia Commonwealth University. She's had her exhibits um, globally, um, Germany, Hong Kong, and all over the US as well. Um, she is a Houstonian now, so that's very uh, a nice thing for us that she's a local. She's teaching at the Glasscock School for Continuing Studies at Rice. She's also teaching at the Art League of Houston and the Watercolor um, Art Society Houston as well. Her work is very um, evocative. It's, um, it evolves regularly, which is really cool to see. Um, and it's very thought provoking. I think that's one of the most consistent things about her work. Um, she has a very large student following here in Houston that's very dedicated to her. And I first met her when I took her class as a student at the Art League. And I remember everyone there had taken her class like a hundred times. And I was thinking, wait, why are you doing that? And then I took a class with her and I realized why they're doing that. It's because she's an amazing teacher. It's a really um, impressive gift she has. So I'm very excited to introduce her. Um, to be our first speaker for this series. So um, the floor is yours. Well, thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks. Oh, yeah. And I realized I was supposed to tell everyone to have a pencil and paper handy for the end. Sorry about that. And questions um, will save to the very end. Um, so you can use the chat, but we're going to hold off on questions until the very end. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thank you for having me and thank you for joining. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I've been really looking forward to this. Um, I'm going to be talking to you today about my project Museum Anatomy, which I've been creating for the past 25 years at this point. So what I'm going to do instead of talking, I'm going to show you some stuff. So let me go ahead and figure out this screen real quick. I'm almost there to start this broadcast. Okay. And here we go. You should be able to see a screen up right now that has my name and I'm Laura Spector. And that's my website right there, laurasspector.com. Feel free to scroll through it. And it might be useful after the fact because a lot of the images, if not all of them that I'm showing you today can be found on my website. So you can spend more time with them if I speed through any of them. Um, and the other two are my Instagram accounts, which I update regularly. The first one um, is more artwork. The second one, Specter Art Studio, is a lot of my student and teaching work that I do. Um, and that one is updated regularly. So Museum Anatomy, one thing I wanna remind you throughout this process, and I think this is really helpful to know, is that I'm keeping in mind the idea of a multi-stable perception throughout my work. I kind of look at life like this, really. Life is never just one thing that you see. There's multiple things that you can see simultaneously. And I think some people forget this from time to time. And it is a practice and a meditation in a way to keep this up throughout life and throughout artwork. So multi-stable perception is being able to see alternation between two or more states um, 
when things are ambiguous. So these are the three most popular multistable perception examples. Uh, the Necker cube, when you stare at it, it kind of that cube flips back and forth based on those center lines, uh, the center verticals. The Rubin vase, which is either you see two faces or you see a vase, and you might see both simultaneously. That's very much like the work I'm getting ready to show you. And the last one, my wife and mother-in-law is really cheeky and funny. Um, this one's a little bit harder to see for some people. It was for me when I pulled it up, I was like, wait a minute, I used to be able to see this all the time. So it looks like a young woman, but when you stare at the necklace, you, it becomes the lips of an older woman. And then there's kind of like this creepy nose coming down where the jawline is. So keep this in mind, this multi-stable perception. And then I'm gonna talk about museum anatomy. So museum anatomy has had many evolutions because keeping up with current trends and how art making evolves, how technology evolves and how we evolve as artists and what we learn and, and how we produce art. So all of this is to say that how the work started 25 years ago is not where it's at right now. It looks very different. Um, early on, we were trying to work directly with museums and this is a kind of a laundry list of uh, countries that we have worked with, meaning that we have gone to the country, worked with the curator directly, and um, created work from their museums, uh, and then exhibited. We didn't exhibit in all of these countries, but we have made work from their storage facilities. So what is museum anatomy? Um, museum anatomy is a project where before we started it, I'll give you a little bit of background, we were doing street performance art in San Francisco for about a year and a half, two years, where I would paint my collaborator, Chadwick Gray, paint his body like a full body painting that was not very elaborate, it was more symbolic, and then go out into the public and create an action. So they were action-based performances. Um, and that was pretty popular to do back then, performance art. And then it was like, okay, well, those images, like one, for example, was a pinstripe suit. So he was painted like kind of a charcoal gray with these really tiny pinstripes from head to toe. And we didn't go out like that, but we did post posters of a photograph of that image um, and watched people as they interacted with these posters in the financial district of San Francisco. So from that, I wanted to do something more elaborate and we decided to work site specific as we did with all performance art and asked the University Art Museum there, Berkeley Art Museum, if we could have access to something that was there but was not seen. And that would be their storage facilities. And we had to edit because as an artist, you're constantly having to edit in order to find a root, like reason why you're moving forward. So we decided I'm the female painting, I'm painting on a male body or a male support. And it's flipping the gaze of artwork because typically throughout art history, it's men painting women. In this case, it's a woman recreating a woman onto a man. So it's slightly different. Um, I'm using body paint because it's ephemeral, meaning these paintings are alive. They're there for the moment and then they're washed away, uh, which means I have to document it through photography. And photography has changed over the past 25 years. When we first started, there was no such thing as digital photography. So things alter and change and get better, which is very exciting for artists uh, and for everyone. And um, so I also wanted to work with relatively newer artworks, kind of 19th century. And I wanted to find artwork that were portraits of women painted by men, which was not hard to do. So this, before I go further, just to explain the art, the paint, it's theater makeup or special effects makeup. So when you see like, uh, a superhero movie and someone's painted blue or green. This is the type of music, uh, makeup that they're using and it comes in all different colors. And each time I set up a, for a painting, I choose my palette. I go through and pick out all the colors and figure out like, you know, all the different values that I'll need. And I've got my water cups there because it's water soluble and, um, and brushes. And I paint it directly onto the body. This is an image of museum storage facilities. They don't all look this nice. These were ones I just plucked off of Google Images. These are from um, regional museums. The ones that I've seen around the world vary. Some of them are caves or the inside of temples. Some of them are five catacombs under the ground in the Czech Republic. Um, some of them are grand stairwells like the Victorian Albert 
and all of their storage facility is really on the walls leaning against these walls of a, like a sweeping a swing staircase so they look very different from country to country these are super nice but you can see all the artwork the museum just doesn't have room to show it all so the pickings are pretty great and plentiful to find artwork that hasn't been seen now things have changed because in 25 years with digital technology and internet most of these storage facilities are now documented and available online and that changed the project as well this is the first artwork that i ever did for museum anatomy this is a painting of a franz von stuck from berkeley art museum it was painted one to one ratio so this is the exact size of the painting on the torso you can see the belly button in the, the kind of in the yellow area and it's painted directly on and then in order to document it we took photos of the finished painting and then exhibited the photograph so these are mainly photographs in nature this is and by the way that one was just kind of a straight up portrait trying to make it look really flat on the body this is when we really evolved i projected an image onto the body before I started painting it to get an idea of where to put it on the body. And as soon as Chadwick's eyes lined up and he started talking, I laughed so hard. I was like, yeah, this is exactly where I want to, I want this work to become that multi-stable perception. And so in a way he fuses with the art and I'll show you real quick where this is on the body. So you can see his eyes, whoops, is this showing? Here we go. His eyes are right here, and I'll move my marks in a second. And then his hands are right in this area here. And then the painting is directly on top. This is a shoulder. This is a shoulder. Okay. Let me go through and clear that. Okay. So hopefully you get a better idea of where, uh, where these things are. Then we moved to Prague, the Czech Republic. That was our first country. We thought we got a Fulbright, but we only got the first part of the Fulbright and we had already told everyone we got it. And so we had to go. And we, <laughs> we had like a thousand dollars between the two of us. And we we're like, let's move out of the country. And it was the first time either of us had ever been out of the country. And we ended up staying in Prague for two years. Um, the piece on the left, from their by the way their storage it took us two years to actually about it took us two years to do the work from beginning to end it took us about eight or nine months to even find out where their storage facilities were kept which is five catacombs underground under a convent and so we had to convince a group of nuns to allow us to have access to their work to, to the work that we wanted to recreate that was very interesting the one on the left is was in storage because the artist Chermak, Yaroslav Chermak, was a court painter and he had an affair with a Montenegro woman, also known as a gypsy, and they had a child out of wedlock. And this is a portrait of his, his lover and their child. And that was a huge shameful thing for the court at the time. Um, so after we finished, just I'll give you like kind of a beginning, middle and end of the story. After our exhibit, the museum recognized the artwork, uh, the original artwork, and not only did they pull that painting out of storage, it became a stamp. And the Czechs are really big into stamps, and so it became like a post office stamp, which is pretty great. The one on the right by the same artist is a portrait of his sister, uh, Marie Sertorska, who was the lover of the King of Poland and an opera singer. And she, the reason why this is in black and white is because the curator um, when I met up with him and he gave me images of the artwork, he handed me a black and white photo and said the original artwork was lent to a family uh, outside of Prague during Second World War. And afterwards, the family was gone and the painting was gone. So we recreated this painting in black and white because that's what we had to work with and took a photo of it. And when the internet became more accessible, I posted this several years later and a man contacted me on a Christmas morning and he was a professor from Canada. And he said, this was a portrait of his great, great, great grandmother and he had never seen it before. And he was a photography professor, so very interested in photographs. And as a result, he continued researching this painting. And over the course of about 10 years, he actually located the original one. And that's the power of art is that it is this thing that you search for it you create 
and other people are involved in the process and it can change things, even if there's little things. So here's an image of me painting on the left, very young and very cold at the time. And then the final painting on the right, and that's on the website. During the Czech um, time period, the two years there, we met many, many dissidents, people who had spent time in prison for their political beliefs or their artwork or anything really. Um, the man in the center with the funny mustache is Oldrich Klopanik. And he's um, just an incredible artist, uh, a master printmaker, draftsman, painter, just incredible. He did a lot of um, political commentary through his paintings and drawings. And he was put in prison actually for a show he was trying to put together for Japan because the government, the communist government believed that the penises were too large. <laughs> so, it, you know, and he shared a cell with Václav Havel, who would eventually become the prime minister of the Czech Republic. Uh, he was a playwright. And so we had met many of these dissidents. They came to our opening. They're wonderful people, incredible stories. I, some of them spent years in prison and we had our artwork up. It was an untraditional gallery. It was owned by Americans and it was a laundromat with a gallery in the front in the front area. And one of the artworks that we created was a reclining Cleopatra whose genitals matched that of Chadwick's. So it was kind of, you know, this mixed gender playing with gender roles of uh, Cleopatra was such a strong woman. It was as if she would have to be a man in order to reign, uh, that type of thing. Well, at the opening, which my parents flew into, it was their very first time in Europe and they flew to the opening, um, we were told we'd have to take down that piece and they put a piece of tape over it that said censored. And so we decided to remove the entire show. And it was incredibly big issue because of all the dissidents that had, were there, you know, to see Americans behaving this way, the American gallery owners. So we removed the show and then it received international press. So which was both delightful and rather humiliating. So how odd to see Americans censoring Americans in the country that had already gotten rid of this regime. So kind of interesting. And it also um, made me realize how important it is to not censor. Um, and I definitely, like everyone picks an issue, mine is definitely censorship as a result of this show. Um, here are a couple of other works. We started working with three quarter body pieces. The one on the right is from uh, Victorian Albert Museum and it's Love with Bo after Burne Jones. Uh, this one here, when we moved back to New York City, um, I was in contact with Museum Africa in Johannesburg and they sent me, they didn't, we, again, no digital photography. They sent me slide positives of the artwork in their storage facility. They didn't really have 19th century oil painting because that wasn't a thing in South Africa. It's less of a thing in very humid climates as well. Um, also pigment was very expensive. It was a rather impoverished country in the 19th century. So instead, the king and queen of Spain would send down their court painters as they were trying to colonize to document the locals. And so this piece here is, to, is entitled Two Slaves Sharing a Dream. And we wanted to kind of activate the canvas so that the canvas or Chadwick was part of the painting that we observe as viewers. So it's definitely multi-dimensional, multi-stable happening here. Here's a couple of pieces from Greece. The one on the right, we decided to do live. We rarely do live pieces and I actually have not done live pieces in a very long time. They're quite exhausting. Each painting takes anywhere from six to 15 hours to paint in pretty much one session because you can't really like stop and you know go go to sleep and come back and do it <laughs> because the paint will smear and whatever so they're very long sessions of complete focus and then we pull out the camera equipment to document it so very few of these are have ever been done live this one was done live in the window of henry bendel's in new york city and funnily this is kind of a funny little story across the street um Rudolf Giuliani and Sylvester Stallone were opening a Hugo Boss store, like they were having a publicity event. And Giuliani told the New York Times to ignore us because we were doing something disgusting and to only focus on the Hugo Boss opening. 
And as you can see, the New York Times did not care. <laughs> so I always think that's kind of a funny thing. Um, the one on the left is a painting of Guernica, which is after Picasso's Guernica. And Guernica was a, a political piece that Picasso did about war and about them, uh, uh, Franco actually bombing a city in his own country, Guernica, um, and killing many people. And we painted that live in the window of Fort Worth um, as we started occupying Afghanistan. And as you can probably imagine at the start of that, this was not a very popular piece with an explanation in Fort Worth. Um, I'd be really curious to know what uh, the thoughts would be now, but that's, you know, that's kind of a, another, that's where we start fringing on political. The one on the right, uh, we start repeating the image for the first time. So Sappho's prayer to Aphrodite, um, and I'll draw on this one again, just so you can kind of see where this is. So this is a knee up here, and then the thigh, and then the arm comes around and wraps around. Um, actually, wait a second. I just could, did I just do that right? Yes, I did. Okay, even I'm confused by this stuff. <laughs> okay, so that's where this is, okay. Then we, um, after 9-11, I was in New York City during that time, and I already had an invitation to go work with a museum in um, Bangkok, and I'd never been to Southeast Asia before. September 11th happened, and we finally got on a plane two weeks after and didn't come back for 10 years. So I guess that's kind of like how, how I dealt with 9-11. Um, the painting on the left is not from Thailand, it is from Japan. And the one on the right is the, the works in Thailand. It was interesting. They didn't have oil painting in the 19th century, um, but they did have cave walls and they did have temples. And instead of their artwork being in storage, which by the way, I'm going to put a little pin right here and let you know reason why artwork is in storage. The first one is obviously museums don't have room to show all of the artwork. Another reason is because some of the artworks need to be restored. So they might be rotting. It could be a chemistry issue with oil paint, or it could be yellowed and it needs to be cleaned. Um, sometimes it's mold, places flood or are really humid and the artwork will start molding. So those are all different reasons. And then in some cases, artwork is stolen and I'm gonna get to that. But the works from Thailand, most of them were heavily affected by the environment. This is, one of the pieces we chose because of the environment. This one was very rotted and molded and almost completely gone. And this is a painting um, of Mother Earth and she's squeezing the water out of her hair to water the, the fields and crops. And so we recreated that one. Then we went to Singapore for an art fair with the Tokyo works and recreated one of the paintings from Tokyo. And then this woman came up in traditional dress and it was just too good not to photograph. She was wonderful. And at the same event, we did a lot, another live painting and we tried to sell Chadwick. And the Straits Times is kind of like Singapore's version of the New York Times. And this was on the cover of it. And we tried to sell him for $100,000. No takers, but I'm pretty sure he's still for sale if anyone wants him. Okay, there's a couple more. This is where we move into digital photography. So before this, we had uh, film photography, and I prefer working with slide positives. I have a Mamiya RZ67 that I love using. Those are really big medium format slides, and I see the image upside down when I take the photo. And I love that camera so much, um, but it became more and more expensive and more difficult to find film for it. So now I have access to a digital camera. So this is where the artwork starts getting rather crispy looking in, in comparison to more naturalistic, softer edges, film photography. And it also gets a little bit more cost effective to shoot this way. And we also can take many, many shots. So we're not just doing one or you know 15 shots. We can take a hundred shots and make sure we get the one that we want the most. So here you have a horizontal Medusa after Rubens. Where the Medusa's neck is, that lines up with Chadwick's lips and chin. There are so many beheadings in art history. Okay, Madeleine of France, the one on the left-hand side, this is where I start taking a really keen interest in art theft. 
this piece was stolen, the original piece, not this piece, the original piece was stolen by an art thief called Stefan Breitweiser. He's from France and he's become pretty well known now. He's actually written a book about his adventures, um, but he went around Europe with his girlfriend and stole over 800 pieces of art. Some of them were little clay figurines, others were small paintings, all from galleries. And when the police found him and they were kind of descending on his mother's apartment where he was storing all of this stuff, she started to destroy the evidence to protect her son. And this particular piece, the original one, she shoved down a garbage disposal and completely destroyed it. So it doesn't exist anymore. And that's one of the reasons why we chose to re reinterpret it. Um, he since has written his book, and I believe after he got out of his eight month prison sentence, he finished his book and then he started stealing again. And I think he's back in prison again. Okay, these are full body artworks. And once we got to this point, we started thinking about how we really needed more canvas space. Like we kind of got kind of like bored with the body. Like there wasn't enough contortions and manipulations to keep working forward with. So we started casting and I don't know why, but we started with the mouth, which is probably the hardest thing to do. <laughs> so maybe if you try casting, start with like a hand or something, but these just continue to get more and more complex. The one on the left, the feet are, com are cast with the hand. The one on the right, both hands and arm are part of the cast. Don't do this one at home. <laughs> no, all of you should probably probably be okay with this. And by the way, P.S. I do want to note that the cup that was in his mouth was his air vent. You know, so the bottom of it was cut out. The one on the right, people always ask me strangely, like they ask me if I cast his skull, and I always answer with, without even thinking about it. Yes, he has a zipper in the back of his head, and that's how we got to the skull. Um. Here's one of the mouth casts so you can see how it turns out. They're pretty cool when you can capture one really well. Then we work with silicone and we also, the bottom right corner where the two heads are the same, we were working with different materials. So the plaster one is really um, brittle, breaks easily and is heavy. So we started casting with a plaster polymer and filling it with expandable foam. It's very lightweight and you can drop it from about eight feet without any chipping occurring. And we did test that on a ladder. Um, so then I was able to expand my canvas, like the one on the left, the arm that goes over the head that's balanced, that is a cast from an arm. And I'm able to paint that first, put that in position and then paint Chadwick, or actually I paint Chadwick, then put it in position. The one on the right, that little arm, that is a breakthrough piece into artwork just living, these paintings living, just existing as a sculptural piece with oil paint, which was always my dream. I always wanted to work in oil paint and I found a way to fuse the two together. This way I didn't have to have Chadwick model for me. I could just cast from a body and I could sit with the painting and spend time with it. So I, and I love the humor that could occur where the cuts are as well. So again, another beheading piece and the head is on the bottom of the, the sculpture. Okay, this is a composite piece where there are five pieces that make one image. And this was because we had access to Photoshop. So we start having technology evolve and our access is becoming easier to it. So the one on the left is a part of a panel and the one on the right is going to be the center piece. So keep a keep an eye on the one on the right. And I also wanna point out one thing on here. There's actually five parts that make up the piece I'm gonna show you. Within this, this is Chadwick's face. These are his eyes, obviously shoulders here, shoulders here. His arm comes up here and he's holding a sculpture of a hand, okay? So this is a portrait of Cleopatra and she is showing everyone how wealthy she is by throwing her pearl earring into vinegar, which apparently dissolves it. Okay, so this is what the composite looks like. It's a lot of chaos in a way, but organized chaos that when you kind of look back and just kind of like soften your gaze a little bit, you can see the overall image taking place, even though there are many, many parts to it. So it almost looks like it's undulating or breathing in person. And this is very much the multi-stable perception. 
And this is one of my favorite pictures of all times. So this is my husband pointing out where all the different parts are to Cleopatra to a group of Girl Scouts. And I love this. And I have to say the best reception of my artwork always comes from children. They love this work. Okay, this is an example of where I started painting on a sculpture, but didn't like the work that I was doing. So it just didn't look right. And so this piece took about eight hours to paint. It was heavily detailed. And I ultimately was like, oh wait, come on down. We've got to do this painting and reinterpreted it again onto the body. So some things work for the body, other things work for sculptures. You know, there's a time and a place for everything and either it works or it doesn't. It's a big experiment. So it's not like we set out to do these things and get it right every single time. Um, this one on the left, we started in, uh, introducing um, props. So there's a silver tray in the bottom left corner. And the one on the right is the first time I ever painted Chadwick as a male character, as St. Matthew. And the angel's head he's holding is a cast from my face. And it's the first time that I was like, well, I better cast myself. It's like a tattoo artist not getting tattooed. <laughs> so I allowed him to cast my face so I could see what that whole process felt like. I have no interest in doing that part again. Um, these are some outtakes. This is my studio cat, Wizard, on the left. He came from Thailand. He lives with me here and he gets hair in every single painting I've ever made. That's how you can authenticate my work is by cat hair. The one on the right is kind of what it looks like every single time we finish a painting. It's like dinner time or it's time to go get a drink or something. And oftentimes we'll just go out with these paintings or we had in the past and it makes for some fun uh, interactions. Okay, so now keeping in mind those paintings that were stolen, I started getting into a series called Museum Anatomy Heist. So stolen paintings now because digital uh, digital technology has made it so that all storage facilities are available online. That was not a very exciting thing to continue with anymore. So I had to make it, I had to make it more interesting for myself. So I started learning more and more about the FBI art crime team, which is a thing. And you can go, anyone can access it online and you can look at the thousands of works of art that have been stolen or destroyed. And I started combing through those works and finding the interesting stories. So the original painting of this was stolen from a dinner party in a home in London, and we reinterpreted it. And I've got two views, so you can see it's doing that multi-stable perception on the right. And then from the left, as you move around it, that three-dimensional head pops right out. Here's another one. I'm so interested in anatomy and what goes on inside the body and the idea of kind of showing simultaneously inside and outside. This is black and white because this piece was destroyed uh, from friendly fire during World War II, as is this piece, but I did add a little bit of color to it based on this artist's other work. The fingers you'll see are crossed. Part of that is because it's keeping a secret and part of it is because it's keeping a promise. And I just kind of like the ambiguity of that. This piece is kind of like the tour de force. This is like we threw everything in the kitchen sink into it. And this piece was created during the height of the Syrian refugee crisis at the time, which is now known as the, the Great Migration. And listening to news reports about it often, um, I was incredibly affected by it and moved by what was going on with all of these reports. And so there was a painting by Rembrandt, Storm on the Sea of Galilee, that had been stolen from the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum. I'm sure you've heard of it. There have been so many movies now. I think they just had the 25th year anniversary of the art theft. There's podcasts, all of that stuff. And I wanted to reinterpret this on a surface that looked very undulating and kind of desperate and lots of motion. And so this, this is comprised of 15 different sculptural elements all kind of put together, assembled together to create this kind of wrestling feeling. And you can see from the left, you, that skull is there with that head that had the cup in the mouth. And then on the right, you can see like how far off it comes. But then when you look straight on, it's it, not totally flat. It definitely has the movement in it. Here's a detail of the oil painting. And Rembrandt painted his own self-portrait in this piece. And he's there um, in the pink hat, right kind of in the center of those figures. This is an image of what it looks like in person. 
And then around this time, we were inter we were asked by a museum in Germany, in Salzweigel, Germany, to come and reinterpret the Lord's Vineyard altarpiece by Lucas Cranach. It's the oldest altarpiece in existence. It dates back to about 1200, and it is the story of the separation of the Lutherans from the Catholics. It was um, commissioned by Martin Luther, and Lucas Cranach uh, found a Catholic altarpiece and painted this story on top of it. It was very shocking. Um, it still apparently is very controversial. And this piece has had a hit on it by three different popes. One instructed um, the Lutherans to burn down a cathedral in hopes of destroying this piece of art, which they heard about ahead of time and they hid it underground. So it still exists. It's still, this is a photograph of it. And uh, it exists under lock and key. One curator has the key. So we reinterpreted it. This is the center panel. Chabrick turns into this two headed monster. One side are the Protestants with their, you know, overflowing greens and they're doing everything right. Everything's growing in the garden. And then on the left side are the Catholics, which, you know, they're getting so drunk they can't keep up their land and things are falling apart. Their fence is being destroyed. And at the bottom, you have. Um, Two, two different groups coming toward Jesus. The Catholics are bringing him jewels and the Protestants are bringing him uh, prayers. So, I mean, it's definitely um, a controversial piece in that regard. Um, this is the Perdella, the bottom piece. I'll go back real quick. This piece here. So the base of it that it sits on is called a Perdella. This Perdella had ger old German written on it. It had never been translated into English. So I found one person in the world that could translate it because not only is it from old German to English, but it's also in rhyme and meter. So he had to uh, interpret it and then make it rhyme properly. So it kept the same meaning. So we cast a lamb and that was really horrific. We got it from like a butcher here in Houston and that was eaten later on. I can't attest to, like, it was disgusting. Anyway, um, but I cast it, I painted the muscle structure because I'm really into the muscle structure. And then that's me painting, hand painting all the words onto it. And this became the predella. And now they have the first English, English translation of this, which I have on my website, by the way. The outside doors of this altarpiece, where I cast two people, I wanted to make them male and female. The original ones are of Martin Luther and kind of his right-hand man. Um, the person on the left is from Nigeria. The woman is from the Congo. And I thought it would give this really great Adam and Eve story. These are the four panels on the sides. They tell different stories. Um, that lamb is in the center of the panel on the right, which is why I chose that imagery for the predella a couple more and these are also on the website there's a great video that shows the process of creating this whole thing and this is what it looks like together and as a trade i asked the curator if i could have access i'll do that work if i can have access to their storage facility this is their storage facility it is a card catalog of all the works that were stolen from this tiny little museum outside of berlin during world war ii none of these works have been recovered it's chilling to me because it's like people being stolen or something but they're paintings um and so i started recreating these and these paintings i started using different models so there are all different types and it's kind of like revising or revitalizing history that no longer exists so i'm not forging it i'm not copying it i'm trying to create something else inspired by history. So here's a couple of the newer pieces. And I'm also using technology again. So back to digital, but none of them are digitized paintings. The paintings are all painted directly onto the body. So um, one of the pieces I also wanted to mention when you photograph, when I photograph these things, um, I've since brought in um, my husband who helps with directing and he has a theater background and he helps to direct my models, which makes it so much easier because I want them to be doing an action while they're breathing in order to get a moment because moment to moment, these paintings change significantly. So I've made a series of small videos as well, which can also be found on my Instagram account. 
and you can see where all the what those look like in motion because they're really cool when they're animated okay one of the things that people always ask me do you make other work and i do because i feel like as an artist art is art is art and you do what you need to do in order to convey what you need to convey so these are two four by four foot um, canvases acrylic on panel and these are in a midtown high rise here in houston these are wood panels these are like wood relief installations the horses on the right are here actually they were made for um they were made for a business in dubai and then the financial crash hit and everyone like left that business so i still have the one on the right but this horse installation is six feet by six feet it's quite beautiful it's wood and it has all kinds of handmade paper and sand and paint and all these different things in it tiles the one on the left, if you squint just a little bit, which I'm going to be asking you to squint again in a moment, but if you squint just a little bit, you can see that that's a face of a Chinese opera singer. And again, that kind of multi-stable situation, multi-stable perception of like, it's very abstract, but then just by doing a little gesture, it comes into focus. Okay. I love painting people's dogs, cats, any pets really. And so I have this really beautiful collection of oil paintings of people's pets. I don't collect them, they're commissioned, but I do love painting dogs. So the one on the right is one of the newer ones. These are also, the one on the left is a commission. This was um, of the physicist uh, Feynman and one of his last chalkboards behind him. And then the one on the right is a painting that's behind me right now in my studio. And that is Patrick McGrath Muniz. I went over to his studio. His work is extraordinary, and he's one of your upcoming lecturers. So I highly suggest you go to his lecture. He's one of my favorite artists in Houston by far. Okay. Um, the one on the left is a self-portrait. That piece is going to the moon in November. Um, somebody from Canada is has a payload that they're dropping off, and it will be in a little microchip amidst several other artists. And I, it's kind of cool, I'm going to the moon. And the one on the right is one of my most recent portrait commissions of someone's children. And this, which I have only shown a couple of people, is my most recent finished piece in my studio. And it kind of encapsulates everything for me as like a self-portrait over the past two years. So, and that is acrylic on panel. All right, so now this is the time where you get to pull out your, um, your pencil or your pen and your paper. And I'm going to take you through a little drawing journey. And then after this little drawing journey, I'm gonna come back and probably exhale and then <laughs> take any questions that I have after. Okay, so take a deep breath, grab your pencil, and let's start a little drawing exercise. All right, this is the thing, these are the things that you need to know about before we start, you are going to be looking for light perspective. And by the way, it doesn't matter if you've never picked up a pencil before, you will be able to attempt this exercise, okay? So these are all the different parts of light. I certainly don't expect you to know any of these things before we start. What I want you to do is look at that little sphere, that little ball, and just notice there is a line in the center that separates light from dark. And that is called the terminator line or the termination line, also referred to as the bed bug line. I don't know why. So that terminator line separates light from dark. You're gonna wanna remember that, okay? This is a value scale. Value scale is everything in fine art. It's the only way that you get dimension and depth. So you have to have contrast if you want dimension and depth. You can see these are numbered one through nine. One is white or one will be your paper, the color of your paper. Nine is the darkest dark that your drawing instrument can go. Everybody's drawing instrument will be different. So you may not get black, black, but whatever your darkest dark is, that's gonna be your number nine, okay? So this is hatching. This is a very fast way of filling in values. So hatching are just little single individual lines that can go vertical or horizontal. In this case, they're going vertical. And then cross hatching on the top right, you can see goes kind of like a waffle pattern. It goes one angle and then the other angle. It's very fast, okay? You can see that you can get darker values 
by kind of squishing your lines together or overlapping your lines. And you get lighter values by giving a little bit of space and room between your lines. Here is an example of one of my favorite drawing artists, well, Giorgio Morandi. He also did paintings, but his drawings are just epic. And they're beautifully rendered with lots of gorgeous cross-hatching, lots of value interpretation. You can see the white of the paper coming through. You can also see the darkest darks where the shadows are. And then he puts in a nice background in them, you know, so there's something back there rather than just a white void. Okay, here is a little demo that I did for class on the right hand side. And this is what I want you to do today. You can go ahead and just like pop one of these four value scales on your paper just to remind you of it. And what you're going to do is you've got, you make a little rectangle and put three little vertical lines in it. So you get four boxes. The first box, you're just going to leave alone. It's paper. The last box, go ahead and fill that in to get dark darks. And you can cross hatch. Mine I did up and down and then diagonal. And I just went over it a couple times. If you use a harder pressure, like you press down just a little bit, you're going to get darker lines. Then your dark midtone I would do next because that way you can balance it off of your darkest dark. You don't want it as dark, but you still want it kind of dark. And then you want to find a value with your light midtone somewhere between your dark midtone and your paper. And that'll just be light lines with a little bit of space. Okay. If you decide to do this on your own with a, any photo that you want, I'm going to recommend looking for a very strong photo reference. You want a very easy separation line of light and shadow, that terminator line, and you're looking for a good composition. The pair on the left is a terrible photo for drawing. It's great for advertising. I want to eat that pair. But the one on the right, when you squint, you can see the separation line, and that's a really good photo for a reference. You, you need shadows for drawing and painting. Okay, this is my rule of drawing. You have to draw something so you have something to correct. So even if you're terrified to make a mark on the paper, make a mark, because unless you make that mark and make a mistake, we have nothing to correct and nothing to draw. So I encourage you to make mistakes so you can correct them. That's the only way we actually advance in artwork. Okay, so this is what we're going to do. I'm going to kind of blow through this fairly quickly. So the first thing I want you to do, and notice squint is the theme. This is the theme of everything in life, is just squinting a little bit. Um, some of you might be able to take off your glasses. That might also work. Okay, so the first thing you're going to do is you're going to sketch a rectangle. And it could be about six inches tall. If you're not sure what six inches are, maybe you spread your fingers and like the distance from the tip of your thumb to the tip of your middle finger might be thereabouts. Okay, so about six inches tall, just sketch a little box. It doesn't have to be perfect. Okay, the next thing you're gonna do is you're gonna draw a vertical plumb line at 50%. So guesstimate, because nobody probably has rulers sitting around. So just kind of guesstimate. You can look at my image and kind of see where, you know, well, you see where 50% is because you don't have your pair in yet. So about 50% down, 50% across. This will give you a little grid. And the grid is going to help you draw correctly. Okay, then I've got squint again, just real quick. And I want you to separate the negative space from the positive space. I have included the shadow in this example. You do not have to. But notice I'm drawing curves with short, straight lines. I don't have any curved lines in there. Curves are very deceiving. And we, can, we are not very good at making curves with our hands and eyes. We're very good at making short, straight lines. So just loosely base, like loosely sketch out short straight lines and just like kind of choppy. Look at your grid and just kind of guess what area of this pair goes into what area of your grid. So you can see the majority of the body of the pair is in the bottom right quadrant. Okay. And, you know, just short straight lines. I'll give you a second for that. And don't worry if it's not perfect. This is just a really quick sketch to get you going with your day. Okay. The next part on this, for those of you who are real quick and ready to go to the next thing, you are going to outline what I like to call big dumb shapes. Okay, so circles, squares, diamonds, triangles, whatever. Whatever those dumb shapes are, just really big and squint. Because if you have two values that are similar, you only get four values to color in which means you have to shove values together. So you have to make some decisions. 
So if you squint, you can kind of shove all your dark values together in one big dumb shape. And you're just separating them. Think of it as like a reverse puzzle. Like you're kind of creating the puzzle pieces that you're going to be coloring in. So these are my big dumb shapes. And I did put in the shadow again, which I saw two different values in the shadow. Okay, you're also working for your, look for your terminator line, that separation of light and shadow, because that will help you. Like that's usually my first line I put in as the terminator line, and then work my shapes from there. You also want to always work big to small, because it's really easy to correct big lines and big shapes when they're drawn lightly. Once you start getting into minutia and details, it gets very fiddly and it can make your paint, your drawing or painting aggravated. <laughs> it makes it harder to correct. So work big to small. Okay, and then finally, this is like speed drawing right here. I'm gonna have you squint again and I want you to hatch. So here you go with your hatching with your four values. And you can follow the direction of the form if you want, you don't have to, there's no law either way and you can lighten or darken as needed. I like to work my dark areas first and put in all my dark shading. And if it needs to go darker, I could go back and cross hatch the other way. The last thing I put in are my lightest lights because those are paper. So you don't really have to do anything at all. So you're just kind of responsible for, you know, those three other values. And you can refine this drawing as much as you like. You can take a drawing like this that looks so kind of unfinished, almost silly. And if you refine it over time and keep working at it, whether you're erasing, which is a tool, not a, not always correction tool, but is a tool to move around your drawing material, you can develop almost a photorealistic image. So the more refined it is, the more photoreal it will be, the more fleshy a pair will become or the less refined, the more abstract it will be. And so you can kind of find whatever you, whatever appeals to you with your time. And you can do this anytime, this is so accessible. Okay, and then lighten and darken as you need and just keep practicing. Okay, so this is my last slide in here and I think I'll have time for some questions. And this is just a reminder of like, oh, hey, body painting that we started with. Um, and this is a picture of Chadwick cross-legged with his arms crossed over his shoulders and he's upside down. Um, okay, so thank you so much for sharing your time with me. And I've got more of my artwork and all the images that you saw at my website, laurasvector.com, including classes if you're interested. Okay, so I'm gonna come back and hopefully have time for questions. Yes, so if anyone has questions, feel free to use the chat. That was really impressive. I mean, I know some of your work, but that was amazing to see. Um, I think I got a ton of feedback already that people loved it. Um, just your body of work, pun intended. Um, so it was awesome. And the drawing yeah. exercise too, I think is a really great introduction. It helps us um, kind of pause. So, um, there's a question about how to contact you. So we're going to um, um, include all that information. It's on our website um, for Laura's uh, website and then her um, Instagrams, and we can um, add all of that to our website as well. So we'll make sure you have all of that information. There is a question about um, how do you see teaching healthcare professionals as different than other populations? Not very different at all. I've had many, many doctors in my classes and nurses and surgeons, like I, everyone you can imagine has been in my classroom. I don't see very different. Um, I, I do notice a difference with chemistry, like uh, people who are into chemistry, scientists that are doing chemistry, um, because their chart, their color charts are really, really good. <laughs> They're very good at organizing. Um, yeah, I don't know if the approach is a whole lot different. I'm very interested in teaching, um, especially surgeons drawing skills, because one of the things I've been reading about over the past several years is with robotics, that there is some uh, disparity with hand-eye coordination. And I think that drawing helps that a great deal. Um, yeah, so I think that, yeah, I kind of teach, teach everyone pretty much the same exact way and it seems to work. <laughs> That's awesome. You're getting a lot of positive uh, feedback here in the chat. 
There's another question from Faith. Have you ever used two models um, posed live as a canvas for your work? Um, that one, that last photo that I did, those two, those two um, people were live together and they did pose together, but the paintings have to be minimized. They can't be really in depth because I really only have a total of about eight hours. So four hours per model and then they model together. Yeah, but it, it's a really special situation because it's rather intimate. So you really have to get a lot of permission and make a make a space feel very safe and secure for people to do that. That's amazing. Uh, and I think everyone appreciated your stories. The anecdotes um, that you added in with all of those, uh, all of your work is pretty, pretty impressive, covered quite, quite a range, which is pretty cool. Okay. All right. Um, I think we want to be respectful of everybody's time. So we have about five minutes um, till one. So I want to thank Laura Spector again. Um, as you can see, this is why she has such a big following. Um, we will make sure that everyone who's on this chat will have access to um, all of her information, including her website and her um, social media. Her website um, lists ways that you can connect with her if you want to take any classes, and you can also peruse her art and a lot of the stuff that she showed today. So thank you again, Laura. This was really amazing. I want to really thank you for taking your time out today. Excellent. Thank you so much for having me. And I hope all of you, if there's any takeaway, I hope all of you try to draw, keep drawing because it is really relaxing. Yeah, absolutely. I think you gave, that was a great intro exercise. Um, so yeah, it's helpful for everyone at all levels. So thank you. Awesome. Absolutely. Thanks everyone.